Okay, so welcome everybody. My name is Chris Webb. I work at Microsoft on the Power BI CAT team, and I am a big, big Power Query fan. So what I wanted to do in this super short session was highlight a particular M function that I really love that allows you to create tables out of nothing, out of thin air. I don't have any slides. Uh, I built this slide deck, uh, realizing I probably needed a slide deck about half an hour ago. But everything in this session is going to be demos. So I will let everybody still trickle in before I start. And let's go to Power BI Desktop. Let's go to the Power Query Editor. Now, like I said, this session is about creating tables out of thin air with no source. Most of the time in the world of Power Query, we are connecting to a data source and we're loading data from a source. But sometimes it's really useful to be able to create a table out of nothing. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that, Chris, I don't need to go to a session to write some M on this. There is already a button that does this. Because, of course, I could go to the Enter Data button up here. And if I click this, I can enter some values in a table like this. All right? So I can en already enter data, any data that I want. Click OK. And it does what I just told you I'm going to do in this session. It's going to create a table with no source. This is great. I use this all the time. It does have one limitation. It only allows me to enter data through the UI. What happens if I want to programmatically create the table and programmatically create the values inside the table? Well, I could try and edit the query here. If we have a look at the M query. Um, but where are the values that I typed in? Well, I'll tell you where. The values that I typed in are here. They are stored in a compressed format, so if I wanted to programmatically alter the values, I probably could do it. I would need to create some values and then munge them all together and compress them, but this looks horrible. It's also very inelegant. So what I'm going to do instead is introduce you to a function. It is this function here. And that's what we're going to talk about for the next 15 minutes ago. Now, first question. Again, I had a bit of a crisis last night. Where's my... Hold on. That's not my desktop. There we go. I had a bit of a crisis. I'm talking about this function, and I suddenly realized, how do you pronounce the name of this function? Because I've always said, oh, this is the, the hash table function. But then I thought, if I'm on stage talking about hash tables, people will think I'm talking about hash tables. I'm not talking about hash tables. This is the function with a hash at the beginning of it called tables. I actually emailed the uh, kind of lead developer on Power Query last night and said, what do you call it? And he said, well, we call it the pound table function. Because I thought maybe it's a sharp table or something, but I'm going to call it hash table. So this is the function I'm going to be talking about. This is the magic function that allows me to create tables out of thin air. Let's see what it can do. Now, let's delete this query. I'm going to create a new blank query. Oh, hold on, can you hear me? I think I was working a moment ago. I was. All right. OK. All right, I'll just, I'll talk a little bit louder if I, I know, yeah, I know it's hard. Okay, all right, let's start to write some code. Now, we need to talk a little bit about data types. In Power Query and M, I can write code and I can use values. For example, if I want to write a data a bit of data and use the data type number, I can just write a number that looks like that. If I want to write a value that is a bit of text, I can write a bit of code that looks like that. So all very straightforward. There are certain structured types in Power Query and M. And there is 
syntax for writing those. Now, this is a little bit more interesting. If I want to write a list, a list is a comma delimited ordered list of values. It's a bit like an array. And when I write a list in Power Query M, I can surround that comma delimited list of values with curly brackets or braces, and that gives me a list. So, that's a list. There's a nice bit of syntax for that. If I want to write something called a record, and you can think of a record as being a table with just one row in it, or something like that, or a row in a table, I can write a record that looks like this. It is basically a list of field names with values associated, surrounded by square brackets. So, M has syntax for defining lists. It's got, list, it's got um, syntax for defining records. But there isn't actually a bit of kind of nice language syntax for defining all data types. And this is where it, things called intrinsic functions come in. And that hash table function is an intrinsic function that allows you to define a value of type table. There is a hash date function for defining dates. There's a hash duration function for defining durations. But today we're going to talk about the hash table function. So let's write it. So the hash table function looks like this. Can you all see that if I write that code? Is that big enough? Good. It takes two parameters. The first parameter, well, it depends. There are lots of different things we can put in this first parameter. But in the simplest form, all I need is a list, a comma delimited list of text values, which represent the column names in my table. So because this is a list, I have a comma delimited list in braces. And I can say, let's have a table with three columns called product, country, and sales. And then the second parameter is also a list. It is a list of lists. Now, in the second parameter, my main list is a list of all of the rows in the table. Each item in that list also has to be a list. And in these kind of nested lists, each item in the list is a value in each column in the row. So for example, I've got a table with three columns, product, country, sales. I want to create a row. I need to add a new list to my list of lists. And I want to have a product, which is apples. I want to have a country which is UK and sales of one. So now I've got a table with one row in it. That's probably enough for now. I'm going to click done. And there we are. I have magically created a table using the hash table function with three columns, product, country, and sales, and one row. If I want to edit this and add another row. I can do that very easily by adding another nested list like this. There's another row defined. Click OK. And there we go. Now, that's the most common way that I use the hash table function. It's perhaps a little bit clearer, a little bit nicer, a little bit more elegant. As we'll see in a moment, it's got some other uses as well. But before we move on to the practical applications, there are a few other variations, ways that you can use this hash table function. For example, here in the first parameter, instead of supplying a list of column names, I can instead just type null supply a null value. And if I do this, it still works. But all it's done is called the three columns in my table, column one, column two, column three. I've also got another option here. And I can put the number of columns that I expect. And that actually does exactly the same thing gives me columns one, two, and three. 
neither of that, those two options are particularly interesting, but I, I just thought I'd include them for sake of completeness. There is another option which is super useful and which I do use very frequently when I'm using this function. The problem with everything that I've showed you so far is when you build your table, none of the data types on any of the columns are actually set. This ABC123 um, data type is the any data type. It's a bit like a variant. It's the I don't know what data type this is, data type. So quite often, if we're defining tables, we actually want to be able to define the data type of the table. How do we do this? Well, this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. What I need to do in that first parameter, instead of supplying a list of column names, is I need to define a table type. So what I've got here is an expression that says, let's define a new data type of type table. And this data type of te type table will have three columns in it, product, which is a text value, country, which is a text value, and sales, which is an integer value. So basically a record with one field for every single table and then the value associated with that field will be the data type we want for that. And now if I run this, we can see that the data types have already been set on the table. Um, one other interesting variation on this is that I can not only create a table with data types on, in the world of Power Query and M, you can even set keys on a table, data type. So what I'm going to do here is take this code, put it in here, and if we zoom in, let's paste this in. This is basically the same code as I had before, wrapped in a call to the type type add table key function, which then says, as well as having these columns, this table type has a primary key on it. It's a composite key based on product and country. And that final argument of true says this is a primary key. This doesn't actually enforce key constraints. It never, in Power Query, you never force key, enforce key constraints. So I could actually put any old junk in this table. But in certain obscure scenarios, performance can be better when you've got uh, keys defined on tables. But that's all the syntax. There is nothing else to show with the hash table function. You've learned everything there is to know about the hash table function. And what I want to do is use the rest of my time for doing useful things with the hash table function. So let's see an example. Now, like I said, in a lot of cases, what we want to be able to do is create tables with our own programmatic values inside. So let's see an example of this. One of the most common use cases is the scenario where I want to be able to find the refresh date and time of my data set. Well, how do I do that? What I need to do is have a table in my data set which contains the current date and time in, in this case, in UTC. Time zones can be a little bit of a problem, but UTC is OK, of when the refresh took place. And I can actually get the current UTC date and time using the function I've got on here, date time zone dot fixed UTC now. That will give me the current date and time when my query actually executed. And this means when I wrap it all nicely up in a table, I can create a table with a column called UTC refresh date of data type date time zone. And this means that when I click done, you can imagine that when we load this in, it will actually have the current date and time. Some more interesting examples. Let me get data from a CSV file. So I've got a CSV file here with exactly the same data that we were looking at before as my CSV file contents. So I'm going to load data from my CSV file. Works nicely except when the CSV file that I'm pointing to doesn't exist. What can I do then? Well, we can simulate that by just going to 
the DAX code and sticking a one on the end of my CSV file. Now, the CSV file source data one.csv doesn't exist, so unsurprisingly, when I click OK, I get an error. And we don't want errors because errors mean the data set fails to refresh. And perhaps, you know, if this fails to refresh, other tables in the data set will also fail to refresh. So how can we fail gracefully? Well, we can handle this using the hash table function. Because let's take an example of where maybe we want to fail gracefully and return an empty table instead of an error. What I can do is I can grab this bit of code here, go to the advanced editor, add this as a new step up here, and we'll say, all right, here is an empty table. This is what I want to return if my, the rest of my code returns an error. How do I know if the rest of the code is going to return an error? Well, I can go back down to the end here. Let's put a comma on here and go back and create a new step. And I can simply say try. So I can use a try otherwise block in M. Change type. If that does return an error, then I can say otherwise table with no rows. Grab this. Put that like that. Click done. And now when my file doesn't exist, instead of getting an error, I've got a table with no rows. But of course, if I go back and change the name of the file to the file that does actually exist, I can click done, and I get the table again. So I can use hash table for gracefully handling errors. And you know, I can do other things here. I can do some clever stuff, for example, handling situations where the column, certain columns in a table don't exist. But we've only had 20 minutes. There are three minutes left. I want to leave some time for questions. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask? Nobody? Anybody online wants to ask questions? All right. I prepared for this eventuality. I've got one more demo that I'll show. I will show you the, uh, the version with no columns in. All right. So let's go and create another CSV file, another query that goes back to the same CSV file. Click OK. All right. It works. But now I've got a CSV file here which is the same data, but without the product column in. So how can we handle the situation where the product column doesn't exist? Let's go back into here. Actually, let's just do this quickly and grab all of this, because this will save me a bit of time. What I'm doing here is broadly the same thing. I'm defining a table with no rows in. I'm not bothering setting the data types, just to save a little bit of space. And then, one other important thing, for my code called uh, my source step, I have removed an extra value here that said columns equals three. I don't want it to fail if it finds less than three columns. So I've had to delete a bit of code there. And then, what I've done is similar to what I did before. But in this case, instead of having a try otherwise statement, I've got a step here that appends the output of the code from the CSV file to my empty table. Now, when you do an append between two tables in Power Query, you get all of the columns that are present in both tables. So because I've got an empty table with all of the columns I'm expecting, and I append whatever I get from the CSV file onto it, I am always guaranteed to get the three columns that I expect. Put that before my change type step. Click Done. And even though the product column wasn't present in the text file, it just turns up as a, ta a column containing null values. That's me out of time. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, please add some feedback on the feedback link. And I'll be around for questions if you've got any afterwards. Thank you.